All right, hello everybody. What is going on? Welcome to Talk About Flow Podcast, part of the Blue Wire Network. I'm your host, Patrick Moran. Thank you very much for locking in, audio side, video side. I always like when I got my guest on today, man. One of my good friends, a recurring guest. And uh, I'll tell you, I'm not counting Joe Yurden, because Joe Yurden is not even a guest anymore. He's my co-host. I was going to say, he's I like part of the much, show. I have him on every single Friday. I think I've had Aaron Quinn on from Cover One, maybe as much as I've ever had anyone on this podcast, Joe. man. It's been a lot of times, man. Your boy Joe's got to be up there. Jo- Although yeah. you guys have taken breaks from each other. I I don't, like. we, we have taken breaks. We've taken podcasting breaks. We've taken friendship breaks. We've taken like Ross followed each other right on here. Twitter breaks. He mutes me at least once a year on Twitter, yeah. man. I just, God, I go after that dude. Get me going like that right off the bat, man. What's hey, going well, on here? You I'm just, hey, there's we have a friend of me uh shtick to me to maintain Joe and I. So anytime yeah. I come on, I gotta take a shot at him somehow. I've said this many, many times. I'm gonna say it again right now. For people, I mean, we're talking about Joe at Buffalo Wins. Um, he's on he's on the podcast a lot. So half you of you podcast, probably got him blocked or muted. <laughs> yeah, nah. exactly. But uh I've said this a million times. He could be a real prick and, a, and kind of a douchebag at times on Twitter and I think part of it might even be, and I don't want to say it's on purpose. He's just really confrontational, but in real life, he's not really that much like that, man. Sure. Like, I have really good conversations with him, whether it's on this show, we've hung out a couple times in person. You know what I mean? And it's, yeah. it's not like, I mean, he still has his opinions. He, sure. he's, not, he's not lying about what he thinks. It's no. kind of like wrestling. You know, they say in wrestling, like in, you're a more exaggerated character of who you really are yes. when you're a He wrestler. goes hard. He's softer and then he comes off as on twitter i've talked to him in dms uh i think a lot of people think the stuff that we go back and forth on uh, on the wall i think people take it a little bit seriously because maybe yeah. some of the interactions he's had maybe have been more serious with people but i've got nothing uh, against the guy so when i'm i'm coming at him on twitter it's all in fun it's all in jest similar to like nate geary nate geary and i are all constantly <laughs> going at each other yeah well sometimes joe and i are uh it extends beyond Twitter and in terms yeah, yeah. of Facebook messaging, <laughs> but we're going at it privately. So everyone else Better you than don't me, see man. that because it's really heated for real. But anyway, uh, Joe's a good dude, man. What yeah, yeah. So you were on vacation, by the way. Yeah. It's been gone for a while, man. Probably Where'd sure you go? What'd you do? Since I got back. Yeah, I went to, uh, I'm from Maine originally. And so we go back there every year, my family and I, um, and my in-laws got some nice property up on the coast. Uh, we have some property up there that doesn't have anything on it. So we work on our property a little bit and then we spend some time on the beach and build family memories. That's a place my wife has spent her summers all, all growing up. And so uh, again, the kids, those memories, and it's great. It's actually, it's a tough time because cover one, we're putting out a ton of content across the, the whole network, obviously, sure. and everybody's working hard. And then I just take off for two weeks right in the middle of training well, camp, part of being in a network though you're not, you're not when you're not your own identity by yourself you could get away it's a little easier yeah uh, greg helped out i was trying to get on and do a show this year but the uh, where we're at is kind of out in the middle of nowhere and the internet's not great so i couldn't hop on for a show but still tried to pay attention to bill's news uh stuff like that but while still disconnecting and honestly for us it's while i say it's a bad time it, for me it's a really great thing every year because we don't stop after the season. We continue to create content. Right. We don't take any breaks. And so it really just never has that ramp down period. And we're doing so many things behind the scenes, Pat, too, that I don't think people see of trying to get the network going and right. get everything else running that it's very busy all throughout the off season for us. So for me to kind of take that step back for two weeks before, because the season's going to be very busy for content creators. We're hoping this is going to be a, a fantastic Bill's uh, Super Bowl run of a season, which is great for guys like us. Uh, but that means it's about to get really busy here in the next couple of weeks. So to be able to step away for a couple of weeks before it really ramps up is good for the mind. And luckily for me, I went away for two weeks. And really the only thing that happened in the Bills uh, offseason or uh, in, in their training camp preseason is players got healthier and players continued to perform at expectations or better. So like, wh- what a, what did I really miss over two weeks? Not a whole lot. Do you miss it sometimes? Like you go to Maine and you, that's where you're from. And that's where your wife is from too, correct? Yeah, I you, was born. You, I'm not from, I cannot claim from Maine. They will, if anyone's from Maine listening to your podcast, they will kill me. I'm originally born. My birth certificate's from Connecticut. Lived there for uh, up until high school. And then from high school until about 10 years ago in Maine. But yes, my wife is from there. All of her family is there. And yeah, we miss it all the time. Do you ever struggle? Like you go there for vacation. So it's fun. Obviously, you know, you're there for a limited amount of time. You're relaxed. Yeah. You get to doing a lot of things. That you don't get to do in everyday life when you're here in Western New York. Do you ever struggle at all when you got when you come back? When you come back here, which is that this is your home now, just like this, well, this yeah. is my hometown, but this is my home right. too. 
like when I was in Florida and I still think about it sometimes, but like when you go back and forth, you kind of, do you ever say to yourself, man, maybe someday we might end up back here. You know what I mean? You had, you had those thoughts that float around in your mind all the time. Yeah. So our, our absolute ultimate goal is how do we, my, my wife and I get back there as soon as we can and, and live in that sort of remote spot that we live, which is hard. Uh, it's probably more of a 15 year thing when the kids are out of high school, maybe mm-hmm. we'll get back there for retirement type of thing. Um, but when we're there for two weeks, it, it flies by. And that first week I get home, it's almost like a hangover of like longing to be back. Uh, it's a, There's a different way of life to Maine that is more my speed. I always call it the last frontier. It really is like you can get out into the middle of absolute nowhere within an hour with no people around you. And you can do that really at any point in Maine. And it's a great spot. Uh, legal marijuana everywhere. So who doesn't like that? Uh, great beer, great food, uh, really nice people. But if there was any other place for me to be, it's right here in Western New York. It really is. My kids are now from here. We absolutely love it here. I love my house. I love this town. I love my neighbors. Um, so it is nice to get home, get back in the groove of things. And it, I will say it was nice this year coming back. People's bills, flags and signs and stuff started popping up a lot earlier this year than I've seen in a long time. So coming back to the buzz and excitement of Buffalo Bills football. I went to the kids game this week with my kid, like getting back to here just has a different feel uh, this time of year leading into football season. They're really not, you know, there's nothing like being in Western New York when the buzz is hot about the bills and they're ramping up towards the season. Do your kids like spending time in Maine? Cause I remember when yeah. I was a kid. So my, my family, my parents, I should say were from New York and New Jersey. And I was born in Buffalo, just like your yeah. kids are born here. And every summer and I'm older than I'm talking about what your kids ages are at right now. But sure. I, from what I can remember, I would, I felt like I was getting dragged down to New Jersey every summer, mm-hmm. kicking and screaming because I wanted to stay in Buffalo. Plus, New Jersey's boring. Sorry, yeah. but there wasn't shit to do. Like, the kids have fun, man. They, they like so, it. my kids are still at an age where it's a lot of fun. We make it a big deal. It's, a, it's really our big trip every year. It's two weeks, it's, a, mm-hmm. it's about a 12 hour drive. So, it's a long road trip to yeah. get out there. Uh, we make a big deal out of it. They get to go see their uh, Grammy and Grampy and their, my brother in law and, and sister in law, their aunts and uncles. And everybody spoils them. There's a little candy store. We bring them to go get candy. There's ice cream almost every night, s'mores at the camp. Uh, we're on the beach almost every day. That Where we stay is a 10-minute walk to the beach. There's another beach four minutes away. There's plenty of wood. So it, it, being at the ages they're at of six and th- three, almost four years old, they're kind of still like, this is cool. We get to go crabbing. We take the crab trap out. Sure. We go fishing and stuff. Soon, we, my wife and I talked about it on this trip, that there might be some trip soon where we're dragging our kids away from their friends, away from their sports. Yeah. To get older. They start doing more things. Yeah. They just want to sit there on their Nintendo switch and tell everybody to shut up and leave them alone. That's kind of, it's coming our way. I don't care how much you love your kids. I don't care. You can be the best parent on the face of this earth. Your kids are going to go through a phase at some point when they they get to a certain age. Yeah. Yeah, They they don't want to just leave them, leave them alone. And they just want to hang out with their friends. And what I'm hoping is they're going to get to a certain age at some point. This is a very cute little summer town in Maine. It's a touristy town, which Mm -hmm. there's absolutely, if you're there in the winter, there's absolutely nothing. Can't find anything to do. If you're there in the summer, it's popping. And I'm hoping they'll get to an age where they don't want to do it anymore, where I can convince them to go work for the summer because there's good jobs out there pretty girls sure. all that stuff sure go work for the summer we got a property there and then make it a little bit more enjoyable that way so my wife and i can still sneak that vacation <laughs> in. that's the plan we'll see that's cool man all right let's talk a little buffalo bills here let's actually start with a piece yeah. of news like there was actually some real I news we're taping this late on tuesday the bills uh they made a trade cody trade ford trade. second round pick from 2019 was traded to the arizona cardinals in exchange for a, a fifth round pick, like every piece of news, Aaron, that when, when it involves the Bills, everybody on social media is going to have their takes, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Their opinions, pretty strong one way or the other. Uh, for me personally, I, I consider this, it's a victory in a way for the Bills for Brandon Bean because it's like, well, first of all, before I, again, and I tweeted about this, let's not just go worshiping Brandon Bean blindly here. I mean, he doesn't miss often, and this is one of the things, going back to Joe, <laughs> that we were talking about on Twitter, that we were arguing about, is, uh, you know, this was a miss, man. And not, he doesn't have a lot of misses. He's got more hits than misses. But Cody Ford, well, in the second round, they trade up for him. It was a miss. What I like about this, well, the, besides the obvious, is they, they got something for a player that they very likely were going to be cutting within the next handful of days. If they didn't trade him, I like the fact that it, it, Brandon B's not afraid to – 
to cut his losses. You know, that's where the victory is for me. Too many times coaches and GMs, they'll draft somebody high or they'll pay a price to trade for somebody and they're going to keep them even when they're not being productive because they desperately want that move to work out for it. He did not work out. Um, Talk about him as a football player a little bit, what you saw and what you think of this trade. Well, so one, I want to set a bar for me personally. People are allowed to view these things, whatever lens they want to view them in. This goes back to, I'll harken back to Shaq Lawson when he was drafted. He was a first round pick and people put those expectations of what they expect out of a first round pick on him. And within that first year or two, maybe I can see, you know, making those expectations on a person. I don't hold a player to the expectations of where a GM picked them, right? That's on the GM. And so that is on Brandon Bean, but I don't hold the player to those expectations. And so I want to start out there that just because a player's picked at a certain spot or a guy was traded up for where those expectations are, but Cody Ford did not perform to where I had expectations for him. Some of that is switching positions um, is, is hard. It's difficult. We do see success stories where players switch positions and they pick it up right away. Not everyone does. You don't hear as uh, about the failures as often you hear about the successes of that type of a move. So it's a difficult thing. And then he did deal with some injuries. So I will give him some slack where maybe Twitter was a little harder on him than they should have been. I think that he can be a nice depth piece for any offensive line in the NFL. I, I think that he can work towards that. He's an inconsistent offensive lineman. I think it's common in the NFL to be an inconsistent offensive lineman, journeyman offensive lineman, and your John Felicianos of the world, guys that are sort of adequate players, probably below average players that float around the NFL. And the bills are actually full of that. That is what they've stacked this offensive line really with is journeyman guys that are kind of just maybe below average, right at that average level of offensive line play. I think Cody Ford's there. I think the problem for him was, you know, and Sean McDermott sort of alluded to it a lot in his press conference today with the guys they released is a little bit. It is a numbers game. I think if you didn't have uh, Greg Mance and and, uh, some of the guys that they brought in here in this off season to add some depth to the interior offense line with some of the vets, I think you would keep a Cody Ford, but but since they've been adding the veteran uh, depth to this offensive line, I think that was just a numbers game. And then, what I'm surprised in is that they got a fifth round pick for a guy that has been inconsistent, hasn't been able to stay on the field, has not really shown any actual value in the NFL yet to me outside of, hey, this is another body that had potential and hasn't lived up to it. Maybe Arizona can unlock that in the same way that Cleveland unlocked White Teller. I I don't see that I, I, for me personally, but I didn't see White Teller coming. But to me, this is a good value. Like you said, Bean was able to step away from the how much they've invested into this player, both in coaching and in uh, the the therapy and rehab and all those things. That's all. There's all money and time invested into that guy. Sure. It's hard to step away from that, I think, when you have that type of investment in a player. And so for him to be able to you know wash his hands of that and get something in return, a fifth round pick is pretty legitimate. I know there was some debate on Twitter about what Brandon Bean has and hasn't done with fifth round picks, but just because why tell it that your, your buddy Joe had said, you know, why teller is probably his best mid or late round pick. He said, that, he said that they, um, he said why teller was their best non first round pick, non first round pick. Technically which, that might be right. I mean, sure. He, he was a, yeah. He's an all pro, right? Um, I don't know that he becomes that player in Buffalo. That's doesn't matter. Sure. But the point is, Brandon Bean has a lot of good, not first round picks too. Just because yeah. Wyatt Teller was an all pro doesn't right. mean that it's not, you can't conflate that too. Then all the other ones are also bad, right? Right. There's huge contributors on this team that were fourth, fifth, sixth round picks on a Super Bowl caliber roster. And so getting a fifth round pick back is not nothing to just, it's not like a conditional seventh round pick, it's, which is kind of something that I would expect for a Cody Ford. I saw a uh, Patriots guy tweet out that that's the same compensation that the Patriots got for Shaq Mason that the Bills just got for Cody Ford. So I think it's a good deal. And it shows that Brandon Bean's able to step away from something, even though that he has a vested interest in it. I think if we would have woke up on Monday morning and said the Bills are going to trade Cody Ford and for a seventh round pick, everyone would be like, all right, cool, fine. Nobody would care. Yeah, they got something for him. But to get a fifth is a win. It is. And, you know, honestly. Khalil Shakir's your fifth round pick, dude. We love this guy. Saran Neal's a great special teams player. He was a fifth round pick. That's the thing about this team right now. It's like in the past. If you said, all right, you're going to get a fifth or sixth round pick, I believe, let me keep the player. You know, I, I know what he is, depth. And I would just roll my eyes, fifth yeah. round pick, sixth round pick, whatever. But we're seeing it more and more with this team. Yeah, they're not drafting all pros in the fifth, sixth, seventh rounds, but they're drafting useful, competent uh, contributors. 
you know, this year's rookie class, which I will actually want to talk a little bit about in a little bit. But like I said, Teron Neal, Teron Johnson, a fourth round, fourth round pick. pick. Uh, yeah. Hamlin was a sixth round pick. Milano. Teron Johnson, I believe, was a sixth round pick as well. I mean, these are later picks that are, you know, looking like they're going to be pretty useful players, man. I'm, I, I think this is, a, again, I think it's a victory for the Bills because he got something for a player that wasn't going to be here quite apparently. Which, by the way, we're kind of related to that. No. Are you surprised to hear? Because I know I mean I know you went to camp a little bit. No. And you were on vacation. Like I said, you've been you've been away a lot. I mean, you're still plugged in as much as I was you still could watching be. you. I was still checking. But in. are you are you at least a little bit surprised to hear not just one? I mean, pretty much most of the, the mainstream media that's covering the team and at practice on a daily basis. There's a lot of singing the praises for Bobby Hart. Does that surprise you? Because from what I've seen with him previously, ugh, not good. And I mean, the consensus that I read immediately after the, the trade of Cody Ford was this is a very clear path now for Bobby Hart to make in this 53. Does that surprise you? Uh well, nothing really surprises me in football. Um, I would have not been betting on it, right? Like, I, I think Bobby Hart's that bottom of the roster type of guy that I'm not mad. Like, a lot of people seem to just get mad that he's on the roster and, uh, like, that angers them. I don't care as much. I actually teased Greg Thompson today, my co-host, the uh, cover one Buffalo. He had put out a tweet that the, the um, trade for Cody Ford was, this is an Aaron Cromer tweet. And I replied to him. I said, no, this is a Bobby Hart tweet. Uh, cause he's, he's always that. given, yeah, he's always given Bobby hard a hard time, but it, it might be like, that's what I'm saying. It is a numbers game. And if they feel more confident with a, you know, a cheap veteran guy like Bobby Hart and really it is Greg's right. It is an Aaron Cormer tweet because I think what it shows is the development of all the guys along the offensive line under Aaron Cromer and what they think that they can get out of them. And so what doesn't surprise me is if you bring in one of these top position coaches, especially along the offensive line, there's something about these top your Skarnecki's, your uh, Callahan's. And I, I don't know the Cromer's on that level yet, but he's right there uh, on that borderline of the top offensive line coaches considered in football. And when you get those types of guys in your building, they really just have an ability to teach the position and unlock things in these guys. The margins of error, error are so slim in the NFL. And the margin, the difference between starting caliber players and backup and uh, practice squad players is super thin. It comes down to coaching and development and things like that. Bobby Hart grades poorly. There's a lot of bad film out there on Bobby Hart. Don't again, don't conflate that with Bobby Hart is a bad football player, right? You can't be a bad football player and be in the NFL. Somebody has not unlocked whatever everyone else has seen in you. And guys like Cromer, Callahan, some of these top position coaches can do that. So what doesn't surprise me is Cromer comes in and somebody unlocks their potential, whether that was going to be Cody Ford or Bobby Hart was probably the long shot to do it. But there's going to be some guys on this team that take a step forward at that position because of bringing in a guy like Aaron Cromer. Well, I'll tell you what, Cromer, if, if he can make Bobby Hart into a, a serviceable, serviceable <laughs> adequate yeah. um, death player, because and I think one reason why Cody Ford w was shipped out, well, there's a lot of reasons, but I think one of them anyway is because and a lot of guys have talked about this. They want guys, backups who can play multiple positions. Yeah. And Bobby Harris would actually get in a lot of work in a guard mm -hmm. this summer besides tackle. And uh, Cody Ford was purely a guard. So I think that has something to do with it. But yeah, I don't know, man. You're right. And I, I don't care if it's Bobby Hart Callahan. may also be, you know, Greg has talked about some of these ways where you can maybe keep a guy in the practice squad because of some of the new rules of what you can do. Sure. He might be, he could be, you keep that 10th offensive line. I don't see that happening, but there's a path to him getting on the roster, but I still think it's not, there's not a straight line to Bobby Hart being on the roster. Maybe. You know, when you got a young player, a, a guy like Cromer, I, I could totally see it. You know, you take a young player and you kind of mold him a little bit. Right. It, it, again, if Bobby Hart could be serviceable, if he has to play, and hopefully that, that doesn't happen because that would mean starters got hurt, but that would be a hell of a job uh, by Cromer. I want to circle back to the recent bills or, or come back to them in a minute. I, I want to, I put up a tweet over the weekend. I don't know why I did it. Maybe it's because I know why I did it. It was because I watched the game on, on Saturday, which we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the game. I mm -hmm. mean, it's kind of old news now, but Josh Allen came in and did his thing. And I put up a tweet, and, and and let me read it for people who are only listening and not watching on the YouTube version, which, by the way, if you are watching this on YouTube, please hit that subscribe button. I said, no Hyper Bowl, Josh Allen's fourth quarter of the Kansas City playoff game. I'm going back to last year now because I just can't get over it. 
I said Josh Allen's fourth quarter of the Kansas City playoff game last year was the best I've ever seen a quarterback play in my lifetime of watching the NFL. No one's ever been better than that ever. All right. Did I have a little bit of recency bias when I said this? And did I have my uh, rose-colored glasses on a little bit when I said this? Because this tweet must have gotten somewhere into uh, some kind of Chiefs fan outlet or something. Oh, no, yeah. Because I spent literally all of Sunday, a lot of Saturday night, but all of Sunday fighting with Chiefs fans, man, who, who told me I was crazy. And in many cases said he wasn't even better than Patrick Mahomes that game, which I – I just think that's ridiculous. Personally, not that Mahomes didn't play great, but Mahomes, oh, yeah, Mahomes kind of had great. it easier, man. I mean, when you're playing 20 yards off, 13 seconds left, and sure. I, you or I could have completed those last two passes. And, and then the short pass to Hill that went for a touchdown before that. Right. Point being is, man, yeah, yeah. what I was trying to say was this. Statistically, maybe not, you know, but every time the Bills needed a play, Josh Allen just made it. And I don't know, like I said, just Here's your problem him, with the tweet was – you said no hyper, like not no hyperbole, no hyperbolic, right? Like, but it might have been. <laughs> it, it, it may be slightly. I don't think what you bit. said is wrong, but that it's ever right, like that no one because Tom Brady had some fantastic moments in the end of games and fourth quarters, two minutes. Like as a Bills fan, even if the Bills were winning and Tom Brady was about to get the ball back at any point in the fourth quarter, you knew that the Bills' lead was about to dissipate, right? Like there's been other guys that are up there. I think your point's true, though, that I think he's in the conversation and at least started to put himself in that conversation. He might need a few more of those types of performances, but the that Kansas City fourth quarter, I mean, I think by all estimations, we've never historically seen the ty- that type of play from a quarterback before, right? And like even the numbers just show that it was totally off the charts and all the types of efficiency, quarterback rating, all those things. I think you're right. One, I made a graphic a couple of weeks ago. So we had uh, Aaron uh, Schatz, uh, Football Outsiders, yeah, on our yeah. show a few weeks ago. I don't know if you caught that episode. I did. It was one I was super excited for. I love DVOA. I love the stuff that they do with their site. I'm, it's a, I'm a big believer in their site. I use it all the time. So I'd set that up. I've been DMing him for like a year trying to get him on. Finally got him on. But they do a football almanac. It's like three inches thick book every single year full of chock full of stats and all that stuff. And I pulled up one. And when you just said that, it reminded me of this and uh, I'll read it to you now. It says the Buffalo bills offense ranked six. So uh, first of all, sorry, I'll pull back DVOA for people that don't know it's defensive value over adjusted, which basically means they take all the teams and how they perform against each other. And they, so basically if you are the top DVOA defense, that's against your peers, regardless of who you're playing. So just because people will always be like, well, oh, the bills played all these bad quarterbacks. DVOA accounts for who you play and when you play them and all those things sure. and, and still it justifies that. So for people that didn't know DVOA is a stat built in with context. So this is a DVOA uh, thing that I'm about to read you here. The Buffalo Bills offense ranked 16th in DVOA for the first half of games last year. So their offense was 16th in the league DVOA in first half of games. They were seventh in the third quarter of games and they were first in the NFL in the fourth quarter in overtime. Not wins are not a quarterback stat, but that's a Josh Allen tweet right there. That's a sure. Josh Allen statistic right there that this team this team moves as Josh Allen moves and they move better in the fourth quarter in overtime. And that's a fact. Yeah. I'll tell you, man, you're right. It might've been an exaggeration. I, and I was a little bit caught up in the moment, but I just keep going back to that game and beyond the numbers. I watched uh, a clip that fourth and four where he should have been sacked three times. And he just <sighs> threw the guy off him, makes a move. And then he runs for the first down to keep the drive going. And it was just absolutely incredible. He's different. He's different. He, even though they lost the game too in Tampa too. I think about the, the end of Tampa, how they came back too. Yeah. The guy was that just Tennessee mo- game. If he sneaks that in, that Tennessee game is a totally different narrative of what, what led me. And, you know, in, in fairness, I'm sure there's a lot of Bills fans. Uh, other teams would be saying the same shit, you know, but I no, never said not now that. There I, aren't I, I maybe Rodgers say- and Brady. Those are the only guys that can talk like that. And Mahomes. I, I never said that Josh Allen was better than Mahomes. And a lot of Chiefs fans took it as me saying that I think Josh Allen's better than Mahomes. I never said that. You know, it's kind of weird how insecure Chiefs fans are about their stuff. They've got Super Bowl, like they've right. got MVPs, they got all this stuff. It's okay for us to put Josh Allen in that conversation with Rodgers, Brady, Mahomes. I I think where people get in trouble is they try to rate him out in order instead of tearing him out. 
There's I an agree. elite tier and Josh Allen is in it with all your guys. I and that's okay. Agree. And let's just have that be that. I completely agree. A hundred percent. It's kind of like how I am with chicken. I, I used to rank every number with wings and I don't do that anymore either. I have wow. them in tears. It's kind of like I, I've said this before. I, and I'm sure you agree with this. If you're bills, if you're the bills and you got Josh Allen, you're not trading him for anyone in the NFL, including Patrick Mahomes. And I think if you're, if you have Patrick Mahomes on your team, you're not trading Absolutely. for anyone in the NFL, including Josh Allen. Yes. Kind of to your point, what you're saying is they're both right there. They're on the same tier. So uh, you don't have to fight about it. No one has yeah, to be insecure about well, it. Well, I mean, they have, Chiefs fans are petty as shit. I, say, I call them, so I, I probably, in fairness, egged them on a little bit. I was just having a little bit of fun. But I said you guys are as insufferable as Miami and New England fans. Uh, <laughs> now, on paper, okay, I've heard so many people say that this is the best Bills team that they've ever seen on paper. And I kind of, I, I put a tweet out. Hey, you're full of tweets this I, week. I, do, I know. Jeez. I have been tweeting a lot, man. But this is this is what I said. I said a lot. Let me know what you think of this. I said a lot of people are saying this is the most loaded Bills roster ever. But let's not forget about the early 90s. You had five Hall of Famers. Uh, Jim Kelly, Thurman, Andre Reid, Bruce Smith, and Loft. And not to mention Bennett, Tally, Hall, Wolford, and Tasker. Holmes and Ballard. We're Pro Bowl caliber players too. It look, this team went to Super Bowls, so they have a track record to go that they're not a paper team. Right now, you have to, I mean, we got to admit this to some extent. The Bills are a paper team right now. You know, they didn't even go to the didn't even get to the AFC championship game last year. They should have went to the Super Bowl, but they didn't get to the AFC championship game. So to me, at least to some extent, anyway, they are the Vegas Super Bowl betting favorites right now. But aren't they not to some extent? a paper team. And so we're clear. Anyone listening or watching, I ain't dissing the team. I'm very high on them. I think they're going to win the Super Bowl this year. I really, truly do. If they stay healthy, and we'll talk about that too in a, in a few minutes, but we just got to back it up a little bit. Like, let's not say this team's more loaded than the nineties the bills right now, because first they went all, out and did it. Yeah. And first of all, the, these are the kind of sports conversations that are so tough to have over such a long stretch of time. Right. Cause those bills, those nineties bills teams operated in an entirely different world. There wasn't a salary cap for those sure. 90s Bills right. years. And so you could afford to keep Thurman Thomas around and Bruce Smith. Like, is, even though Ralph Wilson was a cheap bastard, I think that period of time, they knew they could keep some of those players around. And then you could afford to have a Kenneth Davis as your running back too, which would pro at that time, mm -hmm. I don't know that maybe some of the younger Bills fans realize a guy like that probably could have been a running back one on a lot of teams in the NFL at the time. Like that's how deep that 90s Bills team was that you had guys that maybe even Bill's fans now don't know about because they don't have the legend status of some of the stars from that team pulled, uh, even some of the names you read off. But there's guys on the bench of that team that would have been top contributors on other players in the league because salary cap, no salary caps allowed you to keep your core starters and continue to pile talent up behind it. So I think if you were a team that operated well pre salary cap, it's not fair to compare to a team that's operating well within the confines sure. of the salary cap now, but what I will give people some credit for now is it's a quarterback driven league. I think Josh Allen's a more talented quarterback than Jim Kelly. Me too. Just straight up talent at the position. I don't, I'm not even sure it's like particularly close. I think Jim was really good for his era and an all time great quarterback. And some of the things I've seen him do is incredible with the ball, but he didn't have the athleticism. Let me read a tweet to you from someone else that I'm glad you brought that up because, uh, Sabres analytic burner uh, at Boomer or Boomer Tang on Twitter said this. I love this. Great question. follow, by the way. Boomer Tang's a great follow. Yeah, 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 for sure. And this kind of because my comment kind of dwarfed into a Jim Kelly versus Josh Allen thing because whatever. I mean, it's what we're doing on a Monday afternoon, I guess. Sure. On Twitter. But he said, I don't think there's any question that relative to this league, Allen is the better quarterback. Kelly was prolific for his era. Allen is literally a top five, six player in the league. Kelly was barely a top five quarterback. Maybe top five. Uh, that might be a little bit too much. I think maybe it'd be. I think Kelly was always up four. there, right? Well, yeah. I mean, you had you had, Marino, you had Montana, you had Elway. I mean, you had later on Aikman. I mean, those guys were Favre right still there, was right in there a little sure. bit. So, but my point was, is what he's saying is that Kelly was one of the handful of best quarterbacks in the league. Josh Allen is one of the best handful of players in the league. Period. And here's the thing: some people would say, I think some old heads would say, "Well, look at the quarterbacks at that time, right?" Like the pinnacle of quarterbacks in the NFL at that time. But if you look right now, man, there's a renaissance happening at the quarterback position. I think obviously Tom Brady's still great. He's the greatest person to ever play the position of all time. And he's still playing it at an elite level. 
Aaron Rodgers is right up there, maybe in the top five to ever play the position. He's still also playing at elite level. And then you, know, you have all these young guys up and coming. Patrick Mahomes coming into the league, breaking every single record right out from the start and still hasn't slowed down. Josh Allen kind of on that same trajectory as a Patrick Mahomes. You have Justin Herbert, who's just blown doors. Like, So I don't even think that you can say that era of quarterbacking was that much better. I'd put all these guys that I just mentioned up against sure. all those classic Hall of Fame dudes in terms of talent. And so when you start talking about that, inter- NFL is so different nowadays. Like Andre Reid's a the greatest Bills wide receiver. I also I do think Stephon Diggs is a more talented wide receiver than like, Andre yeah, Reid's. Like you know what I mean? Like it's just kind of like the quarterback deal. Sure, they're better athletes. These guys are just superior athletes. Their craft has changed how they prepare themselves has changed. And so I think like if you were able to suit them all up in their primes, I think this Bills team wins a, a game one-on-one. But in terms of the roster depth, I, I, the 90s team was, I think, more loaded than people remember. Yeah, and I would say this too, and it's always fun. Again, this is always just for fun anyway. Yeah. You can't really compare teams. This is better than talking apart. about anything serious happening right now in the summer of a when you're leading into a Super Bowl run. You don't want to be talking about anything serious in the preseason. We don't want to talk about no. injuries or who's making rosters. This is the kind of crap we got to fill time with, right? I would say the 90s Bills, if you go back to that era of where they had a clear, distinct advantage to me anyway, definitely linebacker because, I mean, you had Bennett, you had Daryl Taylor, you had Shane Collin. Yeah. Now, again, linebackers meant a little bit more in terms of like stopping the run. The defense was just a little bit different back then, but I think the Bills clearly were better a linebacker and uh, offensive line. Oh, I mean, come on, man. Ken Hall, Will Wolford, Yeah, that's one of your top three centers. Those offensive lines like House Baller, Jim Richard. So the offensive line was significantly better. And then Ken Hall should be in the Hall of Fame, by the way. Yeah, absolutely, man. And and then Thurman. I'd say you look at the Bills of today, the secondary is way better today than it was back in the 90s. And I agree with you about Josh Allen. I think think they're better at quarterback now than they were in the 90s. And I guess it depends which 90s team you pick, but like in general, the 90s, that receiver room, man, of like I love, I think Diggs is more talented than any of the dudes there, but Reed and Lofton, Lofton. might be better than Diggs and Davis, right? Don, and Don, Beebe, Don Beebe too. Don Beebe yeah, Don a Beebe. solid number three, man. Yeah. So I mean, that's a pretty good core. I don't, I don't know if I think I could put that up with what you got now. Let's take a real quick break. I'm going to come back. I want to revisit just a couple things from Saturday's game, which kind of uptake that you and I going into the game agreed about so I, I feel like a little bit of a hypocrite celebrating anything about this game but uh i'll be right back and i'll tell you about that all right i am back with my good buddy aaron quinn from cover one i i just said this before the break i i don't want to be a hypocrite because i feel like everybody's a hypocrite. Extent, don't worry about some it extent, We're all... i feel like i should not be gloating i feel like i should not be celebrating anything from saturday and I say that, and I know you agreed with me 100% on this. And this was another thing on social media, imagine that, that uh, I was going back and forth with fans fighting about it all week. I did it on the podcast like with two weeks ago with Joe Yurden. I was pissed off that Josh Allen even took the field. Yeah. And there was probably 12 to 15 players on this roster that if it were up to me, they were not going to see the field for one single play this entire preseason. I did not like digs out there. There's lots of guys I don't like out there. I'm not going to go yeah. through them all. I, I tweeted a whole list. Yeah. 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 So it kind of feels hypocritical for me to be all happy. Like, Yay. They look so good. I'm so excited. Right. Because no, I didn't think they should be. No. Playing. no, you can. No, absolutely. It's not hypocritical because uh, you can do two things at once. You can be upset with the strategy that's being deployed, but then also celebrate that it worked out. Right. Like yeah. you don't have to be. You don't get blanketed or blocked out from that celebration. It's good that the first team looked good because they were put out there to play. I also didn't need to see it. I didn't want to see it. I don't know how much of a significant difference it makes to go out and perform. What was it? Seven plays, six plays, six uh, plays for six plays against another team's backups. Um, I, what I, I think the, probably the biggest thing that they get out of it is warming up for a regular game and starting off a game, the preparation of getting your mind up for that. That's probably the biggest thing that they got out of it in terms of competition. I think they're better off practicing against the first string bills defense in practice than they are against a, a bunch of backups. You went to the, the game, right? Defense. Yep. All right. I watched it at a uh, shout out Imperial pizza. I watched it with a couple of buddies of mine. I was, uh, 
at some point I obviously settled in and I enjoyed the game. I'm not going to lie to you. Kickoff. I, I did not, I was not excited. I was, I had literal anxiety, man. All, you know why Aaron, because all off season long, we've been here for months and months and months that the bills are the best team in the NFL on paper. Yeah. You know, the bills yeah. seem to have it all. The bills are the favorites to win the super bowl. And it's not even the local media. Everyone. The bills. It's universally, everybody. universally, players, everybody. And I'm thinking in my mind, all right, we're going through all this. We're going through all this. And something's going to happen, whether it's Josh Allen or Stefan, something is going to happen in the first series of a freaking preseason game, and it's going to shoot it to shit. And yeah. I kept saying to myself, risk versus reward. You just right. talked about some of the rewards, it, how it was beneficial for them. To me, that did not That's come minor, close. Minor. It didn't come close to outweighing the risk. I don't, let's just leave it at that. It's over and done with now. And again, yeah. the Bills were able to dodge a bullet, so... Yep. I don't know. I, we yeah. had different opinions. Some people have the opinion that, well, they could get injured or practice, right? But I think the more you expose somebody to it is not good. Um, it's a it's a one place where I disagree with Sean McDermott. I, w- my frustration on social media is more times than not, I agree with the things the Bills are doing. I agree with Sean McDermott and Brandon Bean to the point where guys like Buffalo wins and people will call me a homer all the time that I'm always just pounding for the team. But it's also okay to disagree with them on things. And just because they have more success than I do at football and stuff like that doesn't mean that uh, they're immune from people criticizing them or disagreeing with their decisions. So uh, I didn't think the benefits matched uh, the potential problems. I'm with you. And maybe that's just the scared fan in me, but this team has never been so good in my adult life. I've never experienced my favorite football team. Every time I turn on, whether it's good morning football or just search into YouTube, if I search YouTube Buffalo bills, I do that all the time when I'm working out or doing dishes, I search YouTube Buffalo bills. And for years I've watched clips where people are like, Hey, you know, maybe the bills can do it, but they got to prove it this year. It's just gushing good morning football, ESPN, every single outlet universally gushing about this team. And that is so new for me. And then harking back to this preseason has gone since the Kansas City game, since that 13 seconds, everything's gone pretty much perfect for the Buffalo Bills organization in terms of uh, on the field and football stuff. Off the field, too. Off the field, too. They they got Von Miller. Like they had a good draft. They have all this success. They're bringing a bunch of people back. Everything looks good. Everyone's talking about them. And then this preseason has gone absolutely perfect. Like I said, I went away for two weeks. Everyone just got healthier and people started to exceed or, uh, <laughs> or live up to their expectations. Like you didn't hear reports from camp like, oh, this guy on the offensive line, like, you know, oh, Roger Saffold just looks terrible. He's getting worse. Like you never saw stuff like that. It was all, hey, X player is either exceeding expectations or everybody's playing up to where they're supposed to and people are getting healthy. Like there's something behind me that's saying, something's going to fuck this up. Like what? something's going to come in and ruin this for you. That was why game. I was so anxiety ridden yes. going into this game. Yeah. And look, at the end of the day, we, we felt the way we felt. And I think a lot of people agree with us and some didn't. And that's fine. And yeah. At the end of the day, it's much ado about nothing because thankfully nothing happened. Nothing happened. That said, the funnest part of this game for me is some, something happened that had never happened to me ever. I think in the history of me watching a Buffalo Bills game, I don't think I've ever in my life watched the Bills game. Like maybe if, if I had squares or something at the end of a very end of a quarter, but for the first time in my life, I actually wanted the Bills to st- get stopped and have a three and out so I could see a punt. Wow. I wanted to see a punt. I watched the game with a couple of buddies at the bar. And we're sitting there having a couple of beers and we're eating and watching. And they score a touchdown. They score another touchdown. They score another touchdown. They score another touchdown. At some point, I'm like, shit, man, I want to see this kid punt. I want to see if he'll try to kick the ball out of the stadium. Just a little bit of hype. You know, the, 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 oh, yeah. he did have an 82-yard punt, 72 in the air right. the week before. I wanted to see the Bills punt, man. Yeah. And it, did, well, it happened near the end of the game with Matt Hawk, whatever. But that was like on their seventh drive or whatever. But I was. I got bad. <laughs> uh, I wanted them to punt, man. What the hell's wrong with me, man? Well, I get it. I got bad news for you. Mm-hmm. I don't think you're going to see a lot of punt no. this year. I don't think you are. I think mean, like 45, you, 50 punts, maybe. You could be the punter on this team. I said that over the weekend. Too. No, I here's what here's that. I can't because you know what? The, I, I, hold. I put it out earlier. Well, you got to hold. And yeah, I can't do anything that a professional football player could do, uh, period, would take a snap or anything. But other than that, uh, 
I don't. I think the Bills aren't going to punt a lot, and I have a new rule for the Bills that they can't punt in between the twenties. Just let Josh go for it if it's any, and then if it's going to be if you're inside your own twenty, <laughs> let let them let it rip and get a touchback. Who cares? <laughs> That's that should be the plan of attack. Go for it on fourth down. You got freaking Josh Allen who can pick up a fourth and five. You know what I mean? He's a dog. He's going to get that. Otherwise, you if it's within your own twenty, punt it. One of the. Uh... One of the reasons why I, I'm happy to be back home in Buffalo and last year, I mean, I was, all right. So I was back here last year. I was in Florida for five years. I moved back last year, but last year almost. You were busy. You were busy in the summer. I was busy. It was a whirlwind. It was chaotic. I was actually working on some Sundays for Bill's games, making ends meet at the time. I had to work on some Sundays and uh, all that shit sucked. This year, I'm really committed to enjoying it with friends. So anyway, in preseason or not, I'm hanging out with my friends and you know how it is when you're with your buddies, Aaron, I'm not talking about other content creators that study the team in depth like you and Greg and Bruce and a lot of other people do. I'm just talking about the casual, typical Buffalo Bills fan who watches yeah. the, the games on TV and has their takes. And there's water cooler debates about some of these players and a lot of it's stuff that they get, you know, they listen to you or watch you guys. And then they form kind of form their own opinions. One of them, I'm not going to give it any time. I had a, a buddy with me at the bar who was saying Matt Barkley, Renegade Barkley should be the backup and not Casey Case Keenum. Let's skip that, man. That's not even worth it. During the Broncos game, you said that? Yeah, during the Broncos game. Because Case, well, Case played like lights out. He, oh, absolutely he did. <laughs> I, I, look, I, 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 you might have said it. I know a bunch of people said it. Get your apology letters out for him after last week. Yeah. Point being is that, that, that listen, that's not, there's some competition. There's some uh, some roster maneuvering and shit going on with this team. Case Keenum not being the number two is not one of them, okay? He's so, the yeah. number two in Matt Barkley. Is going to be on the practice squad. Simple, that's yeah. simple. He's there because um, Josh Allen likes right. him. The other thing that I think goes beyond content creators and people who follow the team closely, because obviously wide receiver is a big topic. It's also a big topic among casual fans. And there's a lot of Crowder versus Shakir. And the, to a lesser extent, Isaiah Hodgins right now going on with this football team. And let, let me say this. So I, I want to talk briefly about Khalil Shakir because – I've heard his name all summer long at camp, which I did not get a chance to see him in camp. A lot of people did. You did. Mm -hmm. And he's been very impressive. And he was very impressive in the opener against the Colts as well. The kid has looked good. Yeah. But I haven't paid it too much mind because logic tells me that on a team like this, he's going to be brought along slowly. You know, but based on what I'm starting to see right now, the eye test tells me this dude might be out there. Uh, Sooner than I think. Anyway, a lot of people think he's going to contribute right away. I don't, I'm not quite sure about that, but I think this kid is closer to, to playing. Not in the preseason, I'm talking when the games matter. Sooner than later, and I hear a lot of uh, Robert Wood comparisons. I mean, right mm. down to him wearing number 10 right now. This kid has, uh, at least, again, I didn't see him at camp, but in the preseason, man, this dude looks the part. And I don't, I don't think he's going to push Jameson Crowder out of a roster spot. But, I, I mean... This kid might have something to say about playing time earlier than I expected. Again, I didn't pay him much mind during the summer because I'm like, he's a rookie. They got established guys and Crowder. This dude ain't going to see the field in year one unless somebody gets hurt. But that might not be the case anymore, man. What, what are you thinking about it, Shakir? Shakir, uh, this is a guy that I really like. I really do. Uh, the Robert Woods comp, I love a lot. I don't, hand, I don't, I'm not a guy that does comps all that much. Um, I think. I think people confuse comps for what they are. When I comp a player, it's stylistically, right? Like, how does this guy look to me? And when I'm watching him on tape, what what other players do I, in my mind do I look back to and say, oh, that guy, that feels mm -hmm. like it looks like the style that he runs and, and plays with. It feels like this. It's not a, I think this person is going to have this exact career and trajectory and all those things. I think that's what people think when they, uh, every time a big tight end comes out, they call him, you know, the next Gronkowski or they comp him to Gronk sure. and everybody's like, oh shit, we're going to get an all pro tight end. And it's like, no, well, they're just saying he's big and he moves like Gronk, right? Uh, I think the Robert Woods one is great one and not everyone agrees with that, but it, I, I've seen more and more people see it as well. It's just the way this guy moves. When I, Robert Woods was here, he doesn't look like a super athletic guy and he doesn't move around the field like he is or is as fast as he is. But then he's always getting yards after catch, always getting open, creating separation and then smooth hands, really reliable hands and just always kind of falling forward and getting the ball. And you just see that from Shakira so far. The 
one area of the comp for me doesn't hold up yet is blocking. And I can't remember like Robert Woods was always a little bit of a dog, but I don't know if that blocking sort of just got better over the the years that he was here. Or if he came in as a rookie and was blocking the way he was right away, because I do think Shakir, you know, having Aaron Cromer in here again, going back to that and the type of guy that he seems to be, can get better at that, but he's definitely not there yet. Uh, the other interesting thing about him, maybe getting some playing time this year, I think one, the way he's played in practice that I saw and, and then the continued reports that I've heard, he's continued to maintain that type of play. And then we're seeing it in the games week over week where I'm glad you didn't bring up Isaiah Hodgkins as this guy that we're talking about, because we saw that that was a one moment thing and I'm happy for him. And maybe that will be something down the road, but I think people are going way overboard on the conversation about him as a player and what it would mean if he gets cut and taken on waivers. Like I'm not going to lose any sleep if the bills lose out on Isaiah Hodgkins in a, in a cut this year, but Shakir, I think can work his way into playing this year. I think he really can play on the outside and inside and that type of versatility makes him that sort of next guy up. If there's a role to be filled, Uh, I think Crowder's definitely on this team. I know there's been some conversation about whether or not he's going to make the roster. I think he's on here, but I think Shakir is right there. And I don't know that the bills are going to be scared to bump Crowder down the depth chart. If Shakir just continues to trend up, the bills are going to target ascending players and try to find ways to get them the ball. And I think, I don't know that Shakir comes out right away this season, but I think by the end of the season, you see the Bills trying to find ways to get this kid on the field because he's going to just continue to flash in practice. I could see that 100%. I, I would say to start the season, you're Fun probably return. looking at... So I, I agree with you. I don't think there's... I don't want to say any chance. Never say never. But no, James and Crowder is like very, very likely going to be on Who this not? team. The Bean could we be we're not even on Twitter right now. Bean could have just got like a fourth round pick for Crowder. Who knows? Good. Who, Who knows, knows? man? <laughs> I, but I I think Aaron that that you're probably talking six. So they'll keep six receivers. Then we're both. I think you and I are on the same page. That I don't think Isaiah Hodgins right now as things stand will make the initial fifty three. Could be wrong, but the special teams aren't really there, man. Yeah. That's a tough spot to keep a guy if the team. Like people don't, Coomer is not a great wide receiver, but he is a really good special teams player. That's what I'm saying. So if they keep six, which yeah. would be, you know, the, the starting three and then Kumaro, a uh, Crowder and Shakir, you're probably looking at all six of them being active on game days, aren't you too? Because uh, Crowder and Shakir, I mean, Shakir might be returning punts or does one of them two not. Have, if Kumaro's on this team, he's going to be active because he's going to be you, making this roster because of special yeah. teams. You, so Greg Thompson brought this up. This last week, we had Joe Marino on the show, and we were kind of talking about this because Greg was saying this is a player that you could keep on your active roster and just uh, or keep on the roster and be a game day inactive so you don't get into the position like the Tampa Bay Buccaneers were a year ago where they had a couple injuries and couldn't find a receiver to save their lives. Right? There's not a lot of street free agents that are coming in in November to help you out. Um, that would be tough. I would think that that would be one where you really have to have a conversation with Jameson Crowder as a vet out of respect and say, Hey, look, like we want you to be a member of this team. We think we're going to do something special. This is a super bowl run. You're going to be game day inactive more times than you're going to be active. If everything goes according to plan and everyone stays healthy, you're going to be a guy that's just the numbers don't work out and where Shakir's getting the punt returns and he has the flexibility to play inside outside. This is a better use of a roster spot week in and week out than having you on here. But if, Isaiah McKenzie gets hurt or if Shakir gets hurt, we need somebody in that role that isn't Jay Kumro that can come in and play real NFL staffs. And so there's a path where Crowder makes it, but he's not active every single day. But that I think that path requires a real sit down with the vet to make sure that he's cool with it. Because the last thing you want is to have a vet that's not yeah, happy to not sure. be playing at all. Right. Because I think even we heard sort of reports when they with Isaiah McKenzie last year and how they handled him when they benched him and weren't playing him and he wasn't a game day active that he went on Twitter and he was sort of vocal about not liking that. And I think the bills are good enough to withstand some of that stuff, but you want to avoid that when you can. There's going to be good players on this team. I'm not telling anyone something they don't already know. There's going to be good players on this team that get cut and that are going to be on other rosters, active rosters soon. I so, think you said well, something about that, it. I, well, one quick point to that. There are, Mm-hmm. Going to be some good players from the Bills that end up on other rosters. More players in this league are going to get cut that will just end up back on their team, right? Like the, sure. the the common outcome of a cut at training camp deadline 
is that you go out, you clear waivers, and you come back. Not a lot of guys want to guarantee those waiver spots because if you cl- claim a guy, I think you have to guarantee him a roster spot if you claim a guy off waivers. So if you're a team that's going to take an Isaiah Hodgkins or uh, say, I don't think he's going to get cut necessarily, but a bail inspector, I know a lot of people are worried about him, or Black Shear. Now you have to guarantee that guy a roster spot for at least the week one, I believe. Uh, Greg Thompson is probably going to sit in there shaking his head and telling me I'm wrong on this, but most guys don't get claimed. And the other thing about this, Pat, I talked to a lot of people from other fan bases and every single fan base in the NFL right now has a linebacker that the fan base has fallen in love with some, sure. some white late round linebacker. That's a dog. They got a running back that they're just absolutely head over heels with. That was an undrafted free agent. That's going to be the next big thing. Like, Maybe one of these guys on the Bills is going to be a big time contributor to this team going forward, but more likely than not, these are also just your Brandon Riley's, your Christian Wade's that are having nice preseason performances, and we just get hung up in the moment and, and ride these guys' waves. Doesn't it seem like every year the Bills have four or five good running backs yeah. and that are always going to be tough cuts? Like Blackshear is going to be a so tough. So do cut. the other teams. We got to watch our team with the same. If if you're, and they're big... all playing against fourth stringers when we see them doing well too, right? So it's sure. like you, they're getting these big plays, and it's like, oh, this looks fun. I think if you're if you're a Blackshear fan, I do think that you might sweat a little bit. Him cl- clearing, he waiver. could go somewhere. Yeah, because running backs. Oh, like, where is he going to play on this team? Though? He's not <laughs> like, when, when when is he going to get on the field in, in a game? I mean, you got Singletary, you got Moss. Those are locks. By the way, Zach Moss is a lock. Zach Moss is a lock. He's got he's, yeah, got, Cook, he's got a role on this team, and then and then Cook. I mean, Cook's got yeah. There's too much play? too much here, and people need to get too. ready for Taiwan Jones having a roster spot on this team as well. Oh yeah, because, yeah. like he matters more to this team. You saw it Saturday. Yeah. yeah, I mean him, Matekovic, and uh, I can't remember someone else. Another good Serenio. Serenio. They, they didn't yeah. play Saturday. That's your core. Probably your one downfall from what you saw Saturday. I'm like, I remember. I didn't realize those guys weren't playing. By the way, at the time on Saturday, because I don't pay that much attention to kickoff. So after the fact, yeah, but yeah. I'm like, damn, our, our coverage sucks today. Yeah, it's only about the only negative thing I could think of from that game. And that, yeah. I think, not enough fans, in my opinion, took that, what you just said, because I felt the same thing and applied it that, damn, that is more important than I thought. Because every single year, we have the same argument of uh, the Jay Kumros of the world, the Taiwan Joneses of the world. And everyone's like, well, you don't need this guy that doesn't do anything but special teams when you could have Blackshear, who performed really well in the preseason. But to your point, Pat, like Blackshear is not going to touch the field in that room the way it is. And so Taiwan Jones makes more sense because he's a sure. core special teamers. And even though core special teams, uh, special teams, one of my biggest pet peeves, people need to stop saying special teams is a third of the game. It's one third of the units in football, but it's 15% of football, right? Yeah. Like it, it isn't a much, but that 15% matters to all the best coaches of all time. Your Bill Belichick's, your Jim Harbaugh's, your go back to all the great coaches special teams matters to those guys and they want guys that are not going to make those mistakes and i think this weekend didn't get highlighted enough that having those core guys sitting out had an impact on the field and so you're going to see more of those guys than fans are comfortable with those guys that are just your jay kumros your taiwan joneses your manikevich's they're all going to be on this team let me ask you i got two more quick things that i want to get to Let's then i'll it. let you go one of them is all right so you look at this team right now from the start of training camp through two of their three preseason games, what are a small handful of the things that have your biggest takeaways thing that have things that have stuck out to you, whether it's units or, or, or specific players, things that have really, you know, really stuck out to you so far as we're what, just a couple of weeks away from uh, the season starting. You look at this team, you examine this team. Give me one or two things that have really kind of stuck out to you. So far, the things that have stuck out, to me um i'm interested to see how this running game is gonna shake out i think that that's sick i i was a little nervous about that i know you were high on that cook pick Mm -hmm. i didn't didn't love it this is a guy that i see the speed i don't always see the vision i see a lot of the cj spiller bounce to the outside this last game you saw a step forward in some of the vision stuff. That first game that he took a couple and bounced them to the outside and didn't get much out of it. Right. Uh, and this time you saw him work that vision a little bit more and cut some back and make a move and shake a defender, which a lot of, again, in college, his speed seemed more straight line than it was like, Hey, he's going to juke somebody out of their pants. Ty again, Dunn, Ty Dunn was kind of throwing out Alvin Kamara comparisons based on a couple of runs. It's, I mean, it's kind of a, that's a tough one. That's a um, tough bar to set, but yeah, man. But what I will say is on, film and on the broadcast his speed shows up differently than it does in person 
even I've seen him now in camp and then from up in the 200s uh, at the stadium. And his when I saw him, uh, that one bigger run that he had, I saw him make that play live, that burst. He was the fastest guy in the field when he made that burst. And it, it stood out. And when I rewatched it, I've been watching the game back on the All-22 today. He just kind of seemed like he was running with the guys. Like it, it was pretty fast, but it didn't seem as real as it was on the field. And mm-hmm. I, that was also the takeaway I had with training camp. So if he can work on some of that vision, you've seen in training camp and in the games, them finding ways to get him the ball. And some of the stuff they're doing with other running backs, you can envision him getting those reps uh, when they're working with some of the other running backs. So I'm interested to see sort of how that continues to play out because we know they don't want to take the ball out of Josh Allen's hands. But when you do, what do you do with it? And we saw how, again, Devin Singletary looked fantastic uh, coming out of this game. Super slippery, I think solidified again real quick because maybe people were seeing Zach Moss and seeing Cook and not remembering who's Devin Singletary was. All three of these running backs right now to me look good. And this is an interesting problem to have because for years, Pat, we've heard people call into WGR on Twitter saying the Bills need to be this modern offense. They need to pass all the time, forget the run game. But now I think this run game could be a legitimate threat if they use these three guys correctly. And it's going to be a tight balance because I think Devin Singletary operates better with more touches. I think we've seen him operate as the true guy. And so how do you get him getting the best out of him with the, those true touches while still getting Zach Moss, who who looks exactly like the guy they drafted him to be, at least so far this summer, but then still manufacture some of these touches for Cook while maintaining to be one of the modern pass offenses. Like, It's a good problem to have, to have all these yeah. weapons that you want to find ways to get on the field and find ways to get the ball. And I'm excited to see how that plays out. I would say for me, not a surprise. I don't want to say a surprise because it's not, but six rookies are definitely making this team. Um, Elam, who's going to start probably the season, he's probably going to start the season, at least start yeah. the season until White gets back. So he's a starter. James Cook will have a role. Uh, Terrell Bernard, we saw him flash against the Colts, their third round pick. We already talked about Shakir. Punk God has already made this team now. And, and Christian lock. Benford, Christian Benford, somebody we didn't even talk about. But as I managed on the show, I he's a lock, though. He's a roster oh, lock. Oh, he's a, he's a roster lock. Absolutely. Yeah. I barely even know who the dude was last time I yeah. had you on the podcast. Obviously, yeah. I know a lot more about him now. So, you could see Brandon Bean's rookie class. I remember thinking, all right, well, you know, it's going to be really tough to make this team because it's such a good roster. But you're talking a minimum of six guys, six rookies that are going to be on this team. And I don't, maybe Benford doesn't play much at all right away. But uh, I, I see roles for these guys. You know what I'm saying? Not, not, not right. necessarily starter roles, but they're going to be contributors as rookies. And I like that. And then the other thing um, with Jordan Poyer going down, I, I like this Jaquan Johnson. Mm-hmm. I think he's a pretty good player, man. Mm-hmm. I, I I feel, I feel. No, I don't want to lose Poyer and Hyde. No, God, no, we don't want that shit happening. But if Poyer didn't, and I, it looks like he should be back. He's starting. Um, what did what did Sean McDermott say today on Monday? He's progressing. He's getting. He's not practicing yet, but he's getting better. He's improving. Right. If if he wasn't ready to start, the it was season, only I, supposed to be like two, two to three weeks, weeks right? and yeah, two, two, three, two, three four weeks, weeks, right? Right. right. I feel better about the, the bill safety, the depth. I like what I've seen from uh film that I've watched and the preseason with, uh with Hamlin and Johnson. I, I think those are two good safety. So that's, uh that's probably my biggest takeaways is that I'm impressed. Generally what I'm saying is I'm impressed by these young players. I mean, this is a team for yeah. stars, veteran stars, but uh the I like these young kids. Them. Yeah. I think, you know what it is. Uh, um, it's probably a pat on the back to this bill's coaching staff. I think that most, for the most part, their ability to develop guys has, they've done a good job. The place where they haven't been able to do it was Bobby Johnson's role on the offensive line. And they got rid of him and got Aaron Cromer in here. So hopefully they'll be able to get something out of that unit now too. But I agree with you on the safety thing, dude. Uh, I, I'm not quite done with the defensive side of the ball right now. I'm watching it. The tabs open on my window, watching back that preseason game with the all 22 and the first game, I couldn't take my eyes off Jaquan Johnson and, yeah. and Damar Hamlin. And then this game is the same way. And part of that is me just loving safety play in general. But safety play in this defense is particularly fun to watch. And then these guys really, they're not on the level of Jordan Poirier and Micah Hyde at all. Uh, but they're kind of poor man's versions of that unit. And I feel a lot better about the backup safeties than I did going into the season. Great. Right. That's something Greg and I have talked a lot about is what what's next? What's beyond? Micah Hyde and Jordan Poyer and are those guys on the roster and I don't know if 
Jaquan Johnson and uh, DeMar Hamlin are the future of the safety position just because of how the contracts will end up working out. But I think maybe one of them is. And right now I feel a lot better if either one of those guys were to go down for a short period of time. Right. I don't want Jaquan Johnson playing eight, nine weeks. Right. Right. Jordan right, Poirier right. out for the season. Right. But if Poirier is the, similar to the injury he got here in, in, this summer, where if he's out two to three weeks, I feel pretty good that you can get by with a Jaquan Johnson or if, uh, you know, uh, something's tight for Micah Hyde. He misses a sort of meaningless pre regular season game. Not that any of those are meaningless, but if he misses a, maybe a worse opponent getting ready for a better game that I would feel okay with the DeMar Hamlin. And that's a pretty cool feeling because uh, that was a position that you're really, you're really top heavy on and you have two of the best in the entire NFL. But if something happens, man, and this defense is led by that safety position, it kind of all hinges on those guys doing their jobs. I feel a lot better having to watch. You feel season. like with just a week or so before the season is getting ready to start, I think we're what, 16 days away now or something like that. 17 uh, days, baby. Josh Allen is yeah. well, when listening to this. Sorry. You're right. Yeah. Uh, right yeah. Jordan rest. Boyer. Are you starting to feel like it's going to be a long shot for him to get an extension before the season starts at this point? It might be tough. Yeah. That one might be a tough one for him. I'd like to see I, him, I thought it'd be done a, by now. Give him a raise. Give him a two year deal that you could easily void the second year. Give him so he can get a raise for this year. Uh, you know, show them that hey, you're worth more to us right now, and then kind of. I agree, but I thought that'd be done. Right, right, right. That's what I'm saying. I don't. Starting to think that's not going to happen. And although they, the Bills surprised people, uh, because uh, typically business stopped as the season got close, outside of these Cody Ford type trades or stuff like that. But business stopped in terms of negotiations for Brandon Bean, and so last year everyone was surprised. I forget what week it was, but it was like quarter way into the season Taron Johnson gets his yeah. extension and we hadn't seen that type of thing from Brandon Bean so the door's not closed for sure for him working something out but you'd like to see it here soon um I, I, I again I expected it to already be done I um I, I'm glad that it doesn't seem that Poyer's made any I mean we all know he wants a new contract but he hasn't made any noise he reported the mini camp yeah he, uh, reported the training camp we haven't really heard anything about him being unhappy at least publicly anyway so um, hopefully that won't be an issue uh, when the season starts, even if he doesn't get any kind of extension. Last question. So we we, we talk about how good this team is on paper. Mm -hmm. And they are. I mean, they're where they should be, I think. And that's me being objective and not even speaking as a Bills fan. I truly, honestly believe that. I really do. Um, Not counting in. Listen, injuries for any team is the great equalizer. Mm -hmm. If Patrick Mahomes goes down, the Chiefs are done. If Aaron Rodgers goes yeah. down, the Packers are done. I can go down the line with a lot of teams. Totally. So that goes without saying. But if you were to take injuries out of this, do you see anything? And if so, what's the thing that you think could derail the Bills from getting back to the Super Bowl? There's probably a couple things, but is there anything that you could think of that's, yeah, you say, hmm, all kinds of things uh, can happen. And I think about them all the time, all the things that could go wrong because that's how my brain works. And it's hard to win a Super Bowl. I think even when your team's the best team on paper and the betting favorite and all those things, I haven't looked historically how betting favorites do over time, uh, but it's not a hundred percent. You're not guaranteed just because no. you're the best team in September to be the guy left in the Lombardi trophy. We just saw it, uh, you know, the last couple of years, there's guys that are teams that are in the Super Bowl that you didn't have them in the Super Bowl uh, going into the season. So it, it happens. Um, a lot of things can derail it. Some off the top of my head would be, you know, the absence of uh, the absence of Trey white. And maybe if that lingers longer than we think, cause it, we're still getting, Oh, you know, it, it's on time, but we don't have that, what that timeline is. And we heard today of Sean McDermott has a timeline for how long he needs to practice in order to get healthy. But again, that's that timeline we also don't know. And so that my thought is that's probably at least going to be a month without Trey white. And then maybe the preseason has given us a false sense of how okay that's going to be not having Trey white and having uh, Elam out there getting taking lumps as a rookie. Cause that is going to happen. He's going to have ups and downs as a rookie. And then a Dane Jackson who frankly was fine, but was not fantastic uh, picking up for Trey white last year and, and making those two out there could get a little bit sloppy for the bills. And that, first seven game stretch of the season <laughs> one of them are going to be wide the cooper cup and, and l robinson pick your poison week that's going to be mean, a tough at, yeah. a tough test and the that's the thing so say that maybe the offensive line takes some time to get going or they again they maybe they aren't as good as we think that they're going to be and you have a tough stretch of seven games 
if that get that stretch of seven games gets out of hand and then maybe the bills aren't in the running for that one seed yeah, that's where it gets pass. that gets the, they could bury themselves a little bit early in this season they started slow last year that pittsburgh game was a mess uh josh allen was kind of that uh, the offense i don't know if people remember those first eight, eight weeks the offense was up and down it was a roller coaster it was not pretty they can't afford to do that this year. I think you can afford to lose some of these games. They're going to lose probably more of those first seven games than fans want, but you can't go on any type of skid where you're losing back-to-back games and stuff yeah. like that. That's the type of stuff that takes you out of contention for that one seed. And if you lose that one seed, then it starts to kind of crumble away at the opportunity to really capitalize on the Super Bowl. A lot of injuries. Yeah. And it's a very loaded conference. And I do agree, man, you want to be that top seed and, yeah. uh, and you're not to a slow start three and four, two and five, or even three and four, that could cost yeah. you not a playoff spot, but it could cost you home field throughout the playoffs. And you want to be at home in the playoffs. Yeah. And yeah. I don't think either of these other AFC East teams are going to compete with the bills for the division. But I do think that the Miami dolphins and uh, the new England Patriots are going to be more annoying than we want them to be. They'll be hanging within two games, one game where if the bills do slip up, they're going to be sort of annoyingly right there on our heels. And they're, they're also going to play the bills tough at times. And so, you know, these teams have talent and we easily write them off because of how the bills have performed against them over the last few years, and how Josh Allen's done, especially against the Patriots recently. Uh, but they're, if the Bills do slip in those first seven games, one of those teams could be right there making it a lot harder to capitalize on winning the division than maybe we want to talk about right now. I think the Bills will still easily win that division, but I don't want it to be an annoying, hey, we got to drag these other two teams and beat them late in the year. To I want that all wrapped up by Christmas, right? Like we're going into Christmas season where we're coasting. I don't, I don't want to have to worry about that. So that this first stretch of the season without Trey White, those first four games potentially – um, and, and just how those set first seven games look and stack up and historically how the bills have started. That's really the one last spot that has me super concerned. I half agree with you, by the way, when it comes to the division, I'm with you on Miami. I think Miami is going to be a pretty good team. They got a lot of talent and I think Tua's going to improve. I don't think he's, he's going to be, be good great. Enough. He's going to be good enough. Exactly. I think Miami could be a problem. I don't, I'm not high on new England at all. I think new England could be one of those really disappointing teams, uh, this year, but I agree with your premise, what you're saying, getting off to a slow start and then costing you home field in a conference as loaded. Now you got to go to Kansas city in the playoffs or uh Baltimore, one of these really good teams. Baltimore is one of the road. people need to watch. Yeah. Yeah. Right yeah. There. That's the one thing. And then the other thing, and look, I, people are going to hate this, and but I have to say it, man, I'd be a liar. If I didn't say what I was feeling. My biggest uh, concern with the bills going into this season right now, again, not counting injuries, my biggest concern, or my, I think the thing that could derail them the most, because I have to see it not happen to know, is I love, I like Sean McDermott in a lot of ways, man. He has built the culture of this team. He has put this team together. He has instilled character in this team. I think he's a great manager of men, kind of like Marv Levy was in a completely different type of way. Marv Levy was much more easy going. Sean McDermott's tough, in your face, hard nosed dude. I love that about Sean McDermott. He deserves a shitload of credit for getting the Bills to where they are right now. No question about it. That said, he's got a lot to prove to me because... I'll get the... F- I can't help Pat, it. Get out of here. Look, what? it was a collapse last year. The head coach... Did you bad. watch the Super Bowl? Did you I watch, did the, watch Super the Super Bowl? Both, I did those, watch. both those head coaches barfed all over themselves in huge moments, right? collapsing. I think it's more... Go ahead. I will let you finish your point. Go ahead. What does he have to prove to you? <laughs> I know what you're saying. It is more common. You think is Sean McDermott's not the only one of 32 coaches in the NFL who would gag last 13 seconds away, but I can't get it out of my head because it happened and there, it was an inexcusable loss. It should have never happened. And I do put that on the head coach. And this is another thing I was fighting with my boys at the bar about because your poor Leslie Frazier, Leslie poor- Frazier. I'm like, you know what? The Bills called timeout twice and Sean McDermott could have said something and he didn't like something and switched something. He didn't. All right. But anyway, that's just, that's part of it. And then you look back the year before, I think Sean McDermott did a really good job. Got the Bills at AFC championship, but probably that Kansas city game, the AFC championship game two years ago, he coached tense and scared and tight enough. And they just, they didn't play loose and they played conservative and they paid the price. I need to see the head coach in the biggest moments 
the, the, the biggest moments can't be too big for Sean McDermott. And that, until I see otherwise, is what concerns me most about a factor that could derail the Super Bowl run. Because this is a very good conference, man. You ain't going to just run over Kansas City and Baltimore, maybe the Chargers and a couple other teams here, Cincinnati. You know what I'm saying? It's going to be close, tight games, man. And I, and yeah. I need that coach to, 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 to shine in the biggest moments, not gag. And that's what he did last year. I'm sorry, man. I'm sorry, Bills fans. But Sean McDermott, again, he's not exclusive. He's not the only coach to do it. But he gagged. And that scares me. Yeah, I need to see that be a habitual thing before he has to prove anything to me, right? Like, that was a sample size, such a small moment. But what we have seen from Sean McDermott is, you know, I think a lot of people call it, think that he's a conservative coach, but he's up there in some of the top coaches and going agree, for it when I he's agree, supposed I to agree. and t- doing the aggressive thing when he's supposed to do I that. Agree. And I, what I do think of Sean McDermott is I don't think he's full of shit when he talks about all the notes he takes and the learning from your mistakes and stuff. Well, like he that. learned. Yeah. You or Tyler Dunn or anybody in the media that has anything to say about him. There is nothing that Sean McDermott hasn't already put in his notebook and looked in the mirror and told himself that any of you guys can tell him about what he needs to improve on. And Josh Allen's the same way. And when you have that type of leadership at the top of your organization, that's what makes me not worried about that. And so unless that becomes a habitual thing in two to three years, uh, the bills continue to go to the playoffs and things come up short for whatever reason, if it falls on the coach and the staff, then I will have this conversation of, all right, we need to have a conversation about the long-term future of this team. And if they need a new person to get them over the edge, but until that type of thing happens, man, it's Sean McDermott or bust for me. I can't even get behind nothing. I'm not trying to say fire the man. Just no. so we're clear here. Yeah. Man. Yeah. And I will give you that two years ago when they got to the AFC Championship game, I don't think it was just Sean McDermott by any means. I don't right. think the Bills were the better team that week. I think the sure. Kansas City Chiefs at that time were a better team. Last year, I think the Bills were the better football team. They beat him in the regular season. And again, they had him beat. Yeah. It was it, it was a choke job. It was but a big debacle, yeah. It, it was. It was a choke job, man. But, yeah. well, but he's earned a long enough leash from me where True. even if I pull in on that leash a little bit for that, he's he's got some for me. All right, that's fair, man. That's fair. But it is a concern, <laughs> concern of mine, man. I and get it. Put it this way. Let's hope that they get an opportunity to be I hope in he a, proves a you close wrong. game or a, or a championship game. I hope he proves me wrong, too, man. I hope he doesn't prove me wrong, because you know what I hope happens? I hope they freaking steamroll the entire league on their way to win the <laughs> All right, everyone. Give Aaron a follow on Twitter at AaronQuinn716. Make sure you check out Cover One, man. I don't even like just saying podcast anymore, because I do so much more shit than that from the film room to the the written content there's just so many good things going on there make sure you check it out thanks buddy always Appreciate fun you, having man. you on the podcast man hey thanks for having me as always my man all right guys i will be back with you know what i don't know when i'm gonna be back with another episode i might have i am gonna have joe yurton on friday i might do one before that see how i feel talk to you guys later